Good morning. Today, as we continue on in Romans 11, we come to verses 23 to 29. Verses that speak about the future of Israel. But these verses are not just for Israel, they're for us. Remember, Paul wrote Romans to a predominantly Gentile church. So these verses have meaning not just for those of Jewish descent, but for us, for Gentiles. In Romans 9 to 11, Paul's been speaking to this predominantly Gentile church about what's happened to the Jewish people. And these verses are the conclusion of that discussion. A discussion that began with Paul asking a question in Romans 11, 1, I asked them, has God rejected his people? Do you remember Paul's answer? By no means. Or as they might say down south, ain't no way, no how God's going to forget his people. Then Paul gives evidence to prove this, starting with the fact that he, a Jew, has been saved. But then Paul goes on to speak about how God's been at work, saving a remnant of Jews from the days of Elijah right up till the present time. In fact, at the time Paul wrote this, there were actually a sizable number of Jews who had converted to Christianity, become followers of Christ since the day of Pentecost. Look how that remnant's described in Acts 21, 20. And when they heard it, they glorified God and they said to him, you see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed. God hadn't forgotten Israel. He hadn't forgotten the Jewish people. Thousands upon thousands had come to faith in Christ. But there's no debate that a shift was taking place. You can see the shift clearly in the book of Acts. The first nine chapters are all about the evangelism and salvation of the Jewish people. But then from chapter 10 on, it's all about salvation and evangelism to Gentile people. After that initial conversion on the day of Pentecost and the weeks following that, was God done with the Jews? Think about it. Think about why that might be the case. Think about what Stephen said about the Jews as they were about to murder him. Acts 7, 51 to 52, you stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in your heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you've now betrayed and murdered. Just think what happened to Jesus, the righteous one that Stephen was speaking about there. A week before Palm Sunday, Jesus raised a man named Lazarus from the dead. It was a miracle of miracles. That's why a week later, when Jesus rode into Jerusalem, the crowds lined the streets. They hailed him as a conquering hero. They shouted, Hosanna, save. They expected Jesus to be their deliverer. And then six days later, those very same crowds were shouting, crucify him. How fickle is the human heart. How easily swayed and influenced. Surely after the Jews had murdered God's own son, God would be done with them, wouldn't he? Why would he have any more to do with them? Why would he continue to work to save them? And there's a sense we could say God was done with them. In fact, Jesus made mention of the fact that would be the case in that week that took place between Palm Sunday and, and Good Friday. Jesus actually spoke about the coming end and judgment of the city of Jerusalem. In Luke 21, verses 5 and 6, Luke tells us, While some were speaking of the temple, how it was adorned with noble stones and offerings, Jesus said, As for these things that you see, the days will come when there will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. Jesus was saying the temple was about to be destroyed. The system of worship there was about to be destroyed. A little later on in verses 21 to 22, Jesus said, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then know that its desolation has come near. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains and let those who are inside the city depart and let not those who 
who are out in the country enter it, for these are days of vengeance to fulfill all that is written. God is about to execute judgment on Jerusalem. And in 70 AD, about 40 years after Jesus spoke those words, that's what happened. Rome finally had enough of Jewish rebellion and they moved to suppress it. And they began to move against Jerusalem. And Josephus, the Jewish historian, tells us that as Rome began to move against Jerusalem, the people from the countryside flooded into the city as was the norm of that day, seeking protection inside its walls. Because all those people flooded in, into Jerusalem. When Jerusalem finally fell, Josephus tells us about 1.1 million Jews were slaughtered in its destruction. The city, the temple were utterly destroyed. But Josephus tells us Christians did the opposite of what was normal in that day. Instead of running to the city, they ran to the hills. Why? Because Jesus had warned them and told them to. But you see what happened. Within one generation of Jesus' death and his prophecy concerning Jerusalem, the Jewish age in Jerusalem came to a violent end. Was it the end of the Jews? Was it a final judgment by God? A final breaking of the branches from the olive tree that Paul was speaking about in Romans 11? Well, as we keep reading in Romans 11, we get some answers to those questions. Beginning in verse 23, Paul writes, And even they, the Jews, if they do not continue in their unbelief, will be grafted in. For God has the power to graft them in again. For if you were cut from what is by nature a wild olive tree and grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, the natural branches, be grafted back into their own olive tree? Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. And as regards the gospel, they are enemies for your sake. But as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Although not all commentators agree with what this phrase all of Israel will be saved means, based on simply a straightforward reading of the text, it seems to me to mean that God is not yet done with Israel. Yes, God's judged them. He has severely disciplined them because they rejected and killed his son. But in spite of that, God is not finished with them yet. Why? I have no idea. I certainly would be. If I were God, I would have quick fried Israel to a crackly crunch and I would have been done with them. But here's the problem with that. Do you remember our discussion last week when I spoke about how wrong it is for us to hail Jesus as king with our lips on Sunday and then go out and deny it with our lifestyle on Monday? Think about this. How is what we do really all that different from what the Jews did during that week between Palm Sunday and Good Friday? Don't we do basically the same thing every week of our lives? It might be a different of degrees, but is it really all that different? Listen, I can tell you all about that kind of life of acknowledging Jesus with your lips and going out and denying him with your lifestyle. I'm an authority on it. I'm the poster child for it. I've been there and done that, gotten the t-shirt. I've denied Jesus, just like Peter. I've betrayed Jesus, just like Judas. How? Every time I decided to go my own way and I rebelled against Christ's lordship over my life, his authority over my life, I denied him. I betrayed him, sold him out for whatever it was I wanted to do rather than follow him. It wasn't just the Jews that put Jesus on the cross. It was my sin. 
Do you see that about yourself? If I'm honest, the truth is, I deserve to be nothing more than a broken off branch that's thrown into the fire and burned. It's only by the grace of God that I am what I am. And if God can take a wild olive shoot like me and graft me in to his tree, then I want to tell you for sure he can take the broken off natural branches and graft them back in again, giving them life. This is what Paul is trying to get through to us here. It's one of the primary reasons he wants the Gentile church to see this so very clearly. Listen to the warnings that he gives throughout these verses. Verse 25 that we're looking at today, lest you be wise in your own sight. Verse 18, do not be arrogant toward the branches. Verse 20, do not become proud, but fear. There's warnings here for us to realize that we're just like the Jewish people in so many ways but we've experienced grace. We shouldn't look down on branches that have been broken off. We're not that different. We shouldn't look down on those who are apart from the tree because at one time we were just like them. We too, as Paul writes in Ephesians 2 verse 3, lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ by grace. You have been saved. Listen, you're not part of the tree if you are a part of the tree. You're not part of it because you're smarter or more clever or better than other people. You didn't graft yourself into the tree. God in his grace and mercy grafted you into the tree. You were dead. You were an object of his wrath. But in his love and mercy, he grafted you in and gave you life. Don't look down on the branches that are broken off there, but for the grace of God, go you and I. By the grace of God, you are what you are. And if God's grace could reach you, and if it could reach me, then it can reach to anyone. We too were once dead in our sins. God can take dried out, withered branches and graft them in and give them life. This is what Paul wants us to see here. God clearly pictured what Paul's writing about here with the olive tree earlier in the book of Ezekiel through the prophet Ezekiel. Ezekiel 37, 1 to 10. The hand of the Lord was upon me, Ezekiel writes, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the middle of the valley and it was full of bones and he led me around among them and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley and behold, they were very dry. And he said to me, son of man, can these bones live? And I answered, oh Lord God, you know. And then he said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, oh dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a sound, and behold, a rattling, and the bones came together bone to bone. And I looked, and behold, there were sinews on them and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, but there was no breath in them. And then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived and stood on their feet, an exceedingly great army. What a miracle. God brings life from death. Ezekiel was a prophet to Israel during their exile to Babylon in 580 BC, where once again they had been defeated, and destroyed, and dispersed. Most nations, when that happens to them, it's the end of them. But God is clearly telling Ezekiel that will not be the case with Israel. And I believe God is pointing ahead here, not just to their return from Babylon before the time of Jesus, but to a future return. They looked dead, 
They are dead. So dead, they're nothing more than sun-bleached, dried-out bones. But God, who is rich in mercy, will make them alive again. How? Right there in Ezekiel's vision. Verse 4, prophesy over these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Verse 9, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. The preaching of the word, the power of the Holy Spirit is what brings life from death. And I believe that the vision Ezekiel had 600 years earlier is what Paul's writing about here as he writes about this olive tree. God taking cut off, dried up Jewish branches and regrafting them back into the tree again to give them life and give greater life to the tree. Robert Haldane, who wrote a commentary on the book of Romans, said this, what is not done in nature and cannot be affected by the power of man will be done by God with whom all things are possible. He is able to make dry bones live and to restore the severed branches of the Jewish nation. This is our God. He brings life from death. He's done it for us. He will do it for Israel. Think what Paul's been teaching us here in Romans 11. The Jewish stumble, their rejection of Jesus as the Messiah has resulted in the door being opened for the Gentiles to come and be crafted into the tree and come to faith in Christ. Because the Jews rejected the gospel, the gospel went out to the Gentiles. But look what Paul writes in verse 15, looking ahead. If their rejection, the Jewish rejection, means the reconciliation of the world, what will their acceptance mean but life from the dead? Paul's looking forward to this Ezekiel-like vision for Israel. It seems to point to a time, what Paul writes here, when the Jews will come to faith, when they too will recognize Jesus as Messiah. Paul first mentioned this as a possibility in verse 12 of Romans 11. Now, if the trespass means riches for the world, and if their failure means riches for the Gentiles, how much more will their full inclusion mean? It's a possibility. But then in verse 24, he speaks of it more as a probability rather than just a possibility. How much more will these and natural branches be grafted back onto their own olive tree? And then as we come to verse 26 what, that we're looking at today, Paul speaks of this Jewish regrafting, their coming to salvation, as a prophetic certainty, something that will happen in the future. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. But what does that mean exactly? What does Paul mean when he says all Israel will be saved? When will it happen? Why will it happen? How will it happen? Well, let's start by understanding the phrase all Israel will be saved. There's a lot of division on what this verse means. And if you see what this verse means differently than I do, that's okay. I want you to know that it really doesn't change anything. God is going to do what God's going to do, whether we understand it rightly or not. But we should try our best to understand it. The bottom line message, actually, that I take from all of this is that we must do all that we can do to evangelize the Gentiles. We must do all that we can do to evangelize the Jewish people so that their fullness comes into the kingdom, whatever that fullness, whatever that all means, because that's what will pave the way for Christ to return as king and the dwelling place of God will be with man and he will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be their God and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more, neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away this is what Revelation 21 promises to us. And don't you long for that day to come when our king returns and there's no more senseless violence. There's no more sickness, no more death, no more sadness. They're gone forever. If you long for that day, do you know what you need to do? You need to evangelize so the fullness of the Gentiles and the fullness of Israel comes in and our king can return. It's always interesting when you find yourself disagreeing with John Calvin, but I do hear. Calvin took this phrase, all Israel, to mean all of God's elect, 
Jew and Gentile alike, that Israel's more spiritual than, than, a, than an ethnicity in the way Paul's using it here. But everywhere else in these chapters where Paul's been talking about Israel in chapter 9 and chapter 10 and chapter 11, he speaks of Israel as an ethnic people group, not a spiritual entity. He's speaking about the Jewish people everywhere else. So doesn't it make sense he'd still be speaking about them that way here? Why would he suddenly shift gears? So, so I say this with great humility and fear and trepidation. I don't think Calvin's take on this is quite right. I think Paul here is speaking about ethnic Israel, all of ethnic Israel being saved. Now, others take Israel here to mean that just as God's been working in the past to save a remnant of the Jews, he will continue to do that as the years go by and eventually all of Israel will be saved. So they say all of Israel simply points to the day when God has saved the entire remnant that he's going to save. But look what Paul says in verses 25 and 26 again. I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, and in this way all Israel will be saved. Paul's speaking about a mystery here. God continuing to do what he's been doing throughout the centuries isn't a mystery. It's no big secret. It was happening from the days of Elijah all the way through the days of Paul. Remember the verse we looked at earlier in Acts 21. Thousands upon thousands of Jews had come to faith in Christ. This isn't a mystery. It's what they see unfolding before their eyes. I think Paul using the word mystery here points us to something we're not seeing yet, but we will see one day. So along with many other commentators, I take what Paul writes here to mean a day is coming in which there will be a mass conversion of the Jewish people to Christianity. In many ways, Paul's saying the same thing he said in verse 12, where he said, how much more will their full inclusion mean? It appears that Paul's pointing to a day when a full complement of the Jewish nation will come and see and receive Jesus as their Savior, Messiah, and King. Full inclusion, it doesn't sound like a remnant. It sounds like a majority, a large number, a mass of people. The word all here doesn't mean that every single Jew who's alive will come to faith in Christ but rather that so many will come to faith in Christ that Israel will be seen as a Christian nation someday. Remember when America was seen that way? Not every American was a Christian, but Christianity so permeated the thoughts and culture of our country that we were seen as a Christian nation, even though many weren't. I think that's what Paul's pointing to here with Israel. A day is coming when the gospel and the spirit will go out in such power among the people of Israel that many Jews will come to salvation. How? It'll happen the same way it happened with the Gentiles. It's what Paul's talking about as he quotes the prophet Isaiah in verses 26 and 27. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. And this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. How did God take away your sins? The deliverer came from Zion. There's one tree. There's one salvation. Jew and Gentile alike are saved in the same way as as is said in Acts 4.12, salvation's found in no one else but Jesus, for there's no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Those words were speaking, spoken to Jews in that day. Jesus is the deliverer who came out of Zion through his death on the cross. He's the one who banished ungodliness and took away our sins and the sins of the Jews. And there is just one faith, one Lord and one baptism, as Paul writes in Ephesians 4, 5. Whatever this phrase, all of Israel will be saved, means that salvation will only come through Jesus. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by him. It'll come through the preaching of the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit. And the question everyone wants to know is, 
when? When will we see this happen? When will we see this mass conversion of Israel? And Paul gives us a definitive answer in verse 25. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. Previously, we spoke about this idea of the fullness of the Gentiles. And I'll remind you, I think the best way to think about what that phrase means is in terms of a saturation point. When you take a jar of water and you start stirring salt into it to dissolve the salt, it will dissolve and become part of the water. You won't be able to see it anymore. But eventually you're gonna reach a point where the water can hold no more salt. And no matter how much you stir, the salt will still fall to the bottom, undissolved. That's a saturation point. It's not perfect, but I think we can think of fullness in those terms. There will come a time someday in the future where the gospel will have reached all the Gentiles that it's going to reach. There'll be a saturation point. The time Jesus spoke about in Matthew 24, 14, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached to the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come when that saturation point is reached. But part of that end coming includes the gospel going out to the Jews. The way Paul describes things here, the gospel will go out to the Gentiles in its fullness so that all the elect Gentiles are saved. And then the gospel will turn its focus through the power of the Holy Spirit on the nation of Israel. Once all the dry bones of the Gentiles have come to life, the dry bones of Israel will come to life. That's why Paul refers to what happened with Israel as a partial hardening. He doesn't mean it in the sense that they're only semi-hardened. He means it in the sense the hardening's not permanent. God can take the hardest heart and make it soft again. Right before Ezekiel's vision of the dry bones, God said this to and through Ezekiel to the people of Israel in Ezekiel 36, 24. I will take you from the nations. I will gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses and from all your idols I will cleanse you and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. You shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers and you shall be your, my people and I will be your God. This is what Paul's pointing forward to. That day hasn't come yet. And you know, a heart of stone, it's as hard as you can get, right? There's no heart harder than a heart of stone. And dead bones, they're dead. This is not a partial death. It's not a semi-hardening. They're dead. As hardened as they can be. But God says they won't be that way forever. After God has brought life to his elect Gentiles, he will then go and move in his spirit to bring life to elect Israel. Why will God do this? Why doesn't he just write them off and be done with them? Paul tells us in verse 28, as regards the gospel, they are enemies for your sake, but as regards election, they are beloved for the sake of their forefathers. Right now, Israel, the Jews, as I said before, is sitting under God's judgment. They rejected and they killed his son, their Messiah. And because they stand in opposition to God's Messiah, God stands in opposition to them. But all it takes for them to be restored is faith. At the moment, they're enemies of God, but it won't be that way forever. They're loved by God still, even though they're enemies. And if you're a parent, you understand what all this is about, don't you? Aren't there times when your children behave as if they're your enemy, trying to subvert and undo your rule and reign in your household? You may even treat them as an enemy for a while and banish them to their room, but you still love them. Notice again, Paul emphasizes how this falling out's benefited the Gentiles. Because Israel rejected the gospel, because their branches were broken off the tree, rooms have been made on the tree for the Gentiles to receive the gospel and be grafted into it. 
This is what Paul means by the phrase enemies for your sake. God's allowed them to become this so the gospel could reach the Gentiles. But it's only a temporary state. They're still loved. And why are they loved for the sake of their forefathers? Most particularly, Abraham. Remember the covenant promise God made to Abraham. This is so foundational to everything. Genesis 17, 7. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and what? Your offspring after you throughout the generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your offspring after you. This covenant that God made will never be set aside. Israel's in their room for the moment, if you will. But God is once again going to restore them to himself because he made a promise to Abraham. Even though Israel's been an enemy of the gospel, they are still God's beloved for the sake of Abraham. More specifically, they are beloved because of the promise God made to Abraham. God promised Abraham in an everlasting covenant that he would be God to Abraham's offspring. And God's promises never fail. It was an unconditional promise, meaning that God alone would make it happen. Paul alluded to this in, in verse 16 of Romans 11. Because Abraham, the dough, offered his first fruits as holy, so is the whole lump. And because Abraham, the root, is holy, so are all the branches. 2,000 years before Jesus was born, God loved Abraham and called Abraham to himself, promised to be God to Abraham and his offspring after him. And God will continue to love the offspring of Abraham and continue to call them for now a remnant, but sometime full inclusion in the future because God keeps promises even when his people don't. Throughout the ages, God has been calling a remnant to himself. In the future, though, it will be the fullness of Israel. That's exactly what Paul's pointing us to. Look, look what he says in verse 29. For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Irrevocable means they can't be undone. Why? It's an everlasting covenant. God said that when he made it. God would still love them for the sake of Abraham. And because of that, even after they rejected Jesus and killed him, God would still work to bring salvation to them. The gifts God gave to them, their calling, the covenants, the patriarchs, the law, the prophets, they're irrevocable because through his Holy Spirit, they will be the means that God uses to restore them once again and bring salvation to them. The promise God made to Abraham regarding Abraham's offspring, it's irrevocable. It's an everlasting covenant. Listen to how the writer of Hebrews explains the way God went about making this irrevocable covenant with Israel. In verses 17 to 20 of Hebrews chapter 6. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise, the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath. So that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as forerunner on our behalf. Now stop with me and think for a moment what the writer of Hebrews is telling us here. First, it's impossible for God to lie. It goes against the very nature of who he is. But on top of that, look what the writer of Hebrews says. On top of his total inability to lie, God swore an oath to guarantee what he promised to Abraham. What oath? Well, go back with me for just a moment to Genesis 15. As the chapter opens, Abraham's having doubts about these promises God's made to him. Years have gone by and nothing's happened, and Abraham's wondering if this God is really trustworthy. And he says to God in verse 8 of Genesis 15, O oh Lord God, how can I know that I shall possess it? Sure, you told me I would, but how can I know beyond that? In response to Abraham's doubts and questions, God literally cut a covenant with Abraham. In Genesis 15, 9, God said to Abraham, bring me a heifer three years old, 
a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle, turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these, cut them in half, and laid each half over against the other. That was a gruesome sight, wasn't it? Body parts with a walkway in between. But listen to what happened next, Genesis 15, 17. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. And on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham. Now, as you think about that picture, think about how God would lead Israel out of Egypt years later. This will help you understand this picture of the cut up animal pieces and the flaming torch and smoking fire pot. Remember how God led Israel out of Egypt? It was a pillar of smoke by day and a flaming torch at night. That's how God appeared to Israel. This is what's walking through the pieces of cut up flesh. As Abraham observes, God was passing through those gruesome pieces of cut up animal flesh. Why? Well, it was how they cut a covenant swore a covenant in Abraham's day. Usually there would be two walking hand in hand through the cut up pieces of animal flesh, saying to one another as they walk through the pieces, may what happened to these animals happen to me if I do not keep the promises and the vows that I'm making to you in this covenant. But God didn't make Abraham walk through. God did it by himself. Even though it was impossible for God to lie, God unilaterally swore an oath to Abraham that God alone would do whatever was necessary to be God to Abraham and his offspring after him. Salvation would come to the Jews because God swore by himself that it would. He made an everlasting covenant. 4,000 years later, God sent his son, Jesus, to fulfill the promise. Jesus knew that's why he came to earth, in order to fulfill the covenant promise God had made to Abraham. Listen to what he told his disciples in Luke 9, 21. The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and the chief priests and the scribes and be killed and on the third day raised. And then look what Luke tells us that Jesus did in Luke 9, 51. When the days drew near for Jesus to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem in order to keep the promise that God made to Abraham 2,000 years after the torch and fire pot walked through the cut up pieces of animal, Jesus walked up Mount Calvary by himself. There, Isaiah tells us he was pierced for our transgressions he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. At the cross, because he bore our sin, Jesus was forsaken. He was torn asunder from the Father. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus knew all that was going to happen when he rode into town on Palm Sunday. Why did he do that? Why did he set his face and go to Jerusalem knowing he would die there? To keep the covenant, to fulfill God's promise to Abraham, to accomplish God's plan of salvation. Listen to what Paul writes again in Romans 8, 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? God didn't send his son Jesus to go and die on the cross and then cross his fingers, hoping maybe we might take advantage of it. God's plan of redemption was an eternal plan of God, perfectly conceived, perfectly executed. It was the will of God to save all his people, Jew and Gentile alike. And it's accomplished through the atoning work of, cross, of Christ at the cross. Think about that this Good Friday week. Think about it and rejoice in the salvation God has brought to you. Rejoice that God in his love and mercy 
took your dead and cold and rebellious heart and made you alive in Christ. And if he's done that for you, he can do that for other Gentiles in your circle of influence. He can do that for Jews that seem so distant and so far from the kingdom of God and from the hope of salvation. Go and evangelize and share the gospel. And God will do all he accomplished to do because he's guaranteed it with an oath so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. And we would have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters the inner place behind the curtain where Jesus has gone as forerunner on our behalf. Cling to Jesus. He is the fulfillment of all the promises that God made to be God to you and your descendants after you. Let's pray. Father, we give you thanks that you are a God who doesn't lie, that you are a God who keeps his word, that you are a God who assures us of the salvation that is ours in Christ because you pictured it way back in Genesis 15, you fulfilled it at the cross, and you testify to it today. Father, I pray that we would rejoice in this love that will not let us go, that we will hold fast to the hope that is ours in Christ, and that we will go and make this hope known to the world around us. And we ask this in Christ's name. Amen.